Okay. Well, welcome uh, to the Roseville Area High School. The Fire Bears are putting on this motion magic seminar, and we've asked a very experienced person, Corey Applegate, here to do this. I, I don't know about your teams, but I know that a lot of times we struggle with PID and some of that type stuff, so I want to have that smooth operating robot that everyone gets all excited about, and so... To do that, we have to turn to the experts. So we got Corey here, so I guess I'll turn it over to you. Welcome. I guess I do want to say welcome. Um, it's kind of uh, exciting to see so many teams looking to do some very specific stuff like this. So with that, right. go ahead, Corey. You mic me up here. I turned it on. Everyone can hear me just fine? So I could technically go without a mic. I have a very loud voice, and an hour talk is not tough for me. But thanks for inviting me down here, 2846 Fire Bears. Uh, I hope everyone got a handout. That handout has a lot of links. The slideshow will be available for you, you know, and your teammates and other teams that you may be involved with, as long as some other links of worksheets that we've created to help us calculate these values and what we need. So not the... Uh, not to stall much longer. I know slideshows are very boring, so we do have a couple slides. We're going to get halfway through, and then we'll abandon the slides and actually go right into the live demo. The demo is in the slides as well, so when you go review it, those slides should be relevant to what we're talking about. But a little bit about us. There's three of us that came down here from St. Cloud today. Um, again, my name is Corey Applegate. I've been working at Electrolux in St. Cloud for 21 years as an electrical controls technician. I did mentor a Lego Mindstorms team in grade school. We just kind of mocked up some stuff. It was it just experimented with robotics. That was kind of the start of all this. Um, my first year with FIRST, or this is my fourth year with FIRST. Uh, we're kind of moving on. Uh, I've, I've been the lead mentor, and I'm kind of gravitating over to the CSA uh, angle of it. So at the events, you'll be able to start seeing a little bit more of me as we're looking for a new coach. But uh I've been fortunate for the last two years to be a Limelight pro or, uh, beta tester. So version one and version two with uh, 987 uh, high rollers. And last year I was part of the Java VS Code beta test team along with a lot of other the CSAs in Minnesota. Today I have my son with me, Austin. He's helping with the presentation. Uh, voice your few things about you. No? Hello. So yeah, my name's Austin Applegate. I'm a senior at Tech High School, and I'm going to the U of M next year in the fall, right around here. And I just kind of, I've been a driver for four years, co-drive my freshman year, and then the lead driver for sophomore through senior. I do a little bit of building and a little bit of coding as well. And just some things I do in my free time include football and just some PC building and gaming. And I don't believe Carter, you have a mic up there. You want me to talk? Carter was a student uh, from another, another local high school down in St. Cloud from Sartell. He became a part of the Gearheads, and when Sartell had their own team, he just continued on with us because we're so much fun. Uh, he's going to school. He was a student last year and the co-driver, and this year he returned back as our, our drive coach. And he's going to school at SCTCC for what is the network administration, you just change that. So you can see a couple of the hobbies up there. So moving on. So in FRC, we typically kind of control our robots in two ways. And we're kind of scared of that PID and that motion control stuff. So a lot of times we find ourselves in open loop. The driver just commands it to do something or we use a timer or some other way to control our robot and our autonomous and hope that it does things repeatedly. But as we've noticed, quickly that it's not repeatable. You hold the sticks different timing, uh, batteries wear out. So open loop is a thing that we use, but not very often. And then kind of the barrier to entry, closed loop. You know, there's a few closed loop for both velocity and position. You know, we define a set point. Uh, some computer in the background says, here's where we are. Here's where we're go we need to go and controls our system. And we get, have the PIDF, typical PID controller, motion magic, which we're going to talk about today, and then like the, 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 the next level of the motion profiling. I'm still, still just starting to touch on that. I'm actually figuring that out myself yet. So, but it's measurably repeatable when it's tuned properly. And we're going to go through those steps. And if you're scared of PID, you're going to say, well, that wasn't so hard because we have some formulas and some worksheets to help you get there. So 
kind of the PID. Again, we have a set point, we're here. There's, we multiply that error by some proportional value. The output is max speed, so the motors just turn on, and we race off to our set point. As we get closer, that error gets smaller, and it starts to slow down, and we don't get quite there, so we have to start tuning up our I's and our D's. Most of Magic's a little different, <laughs> where we define an acceleration. So we say we're not just going to go on and go. We're going to say we're going to ramp up at some rate till we get to a cruising velocity, and maybe not max. Maybe we say, you know what, we only want to drive at 75%. So we're going to say, accelerate up to this 75%, hang out there, and then decelerate when you get there. Don't just, until we get to the set point. And motion profile, we actually, every, in the Talon SRXs, every 10 milliseconds, you define, this is where we're going to be, this is how fast we're going to go. 10 milliseconds later, this is where we're going to be, this is how fast we're going to go. And you define every point along that way. So you can actually control it, maybe hang out, slow down one side or another motor, you control the entire profile so you can see the red and the gray lines follow each other. Or motion magic does the same thing, but we only define one point. We define where we want to go. Motion profile, we define every little point the entire way through the process. So today, we are going to be talking about PID, but in the motion magic, we're going to, first thing we need to do with every PID controller is what? It's on there, so it's that. We have to make sure our motors and our input, our feedback is in phase with each other. When we command it to do a positive motion, we want a positive feedback. And when we go negative, we want negative feedback. Keep them in the same direction. We're going to figure out feed forward, very simple. You'll see in a second, our cruise velocity, our acceleration, KP, KI, KD, and finally, we'll look at some arbitrary feed forward. Comes in real handy when you start working with arms. Uh, tools we'll use today, many of you, if you're uh, the programmers, you've updated your Talon SRXs, because that's one of the key features here is you, you must have the Talon SRX motor controller hooked up through CAN and the feedback device must plug into the data port, the, the gadgeteer port, using either a breakout board if you're using analog or if you're using a magnetic encoder, they plug directly in with the ribbon cable. But you use the Phoenix tuner to upgrade your firmware, and probably most of you leave at that point. You've never continued to look at the other tabs. Well, there's a bunch of other tabs and there are really cool things you can do on there. Oh, writing some code, you can jog your motors right from that, that application. There's also a real great plotting tool, and that's what we're going to use today is without writing any code in your program, that plotting tool connects directly to the Talon SRX and extracts the data out for you and plots it on a nice graph. We're going to use the console output that's on our driver stations. Uh, shuffleboard, there we do have to write some code to push some information up there. And other things you'll need in that what worksheet down there, I'll have links to it. you can find it online by searching Crossroad Electronics, but we're going to look at their sample code. Everything we do on our robots, we start out with their sample code. We modify their sample code, get that cell system working, and then eventually we'll have three different chunks of sample code that we'll pull out the data and push it into our regular robot. And then we've created a, a, a Google worksheet with all the formulas. You just plug in some data and it spits out the information. That worksheet has links to the documentation on Crossroad Electronics uh, pages of how, what the formulas look like, how they work, and how they got there. As w so what do we got next? So what we're going to do in our sample code, or when we get in a sample code, we need to set the talons to the node address that we are using. So we have to take their samples and adapt it to our program. So we'll set the CAN address. Joysticks are usually OK, set at 0. We'll comment out different chunks of the program. Now, if you're doing this for the first time, I would suggest doing it on a drivetrain where the wheel can spin indefinitely. So if you do something wrong and you have it propped up off the ground, nothing catastrophic will happen. And it's happened in our basement. Our door has a big hole in it and those laminations have blown apart because something went wrong and then the robots took off on us. So you learn quick on that. We're gonna look at our elevator. Well, our elevator has a very limited mo range of motion. So we have to be careful there. So when possible, disconnect the mechanical and just use the motor and the encoders or drive the encoder separately to make sure everything's working just right. Um, we have to config configure our feedback sensor. The sample code uses the, the, magnet, the CTRE magnetic encoder. Everyone kind of familiar with those? Maybe, maybe not. They're really handy for drivetrains and a lot of rotational thing where you can get at the axle. We like to use a lot of analog potentiometers 
because when you power up, there's no zeroing. It just knows where it is. You shut it off, you move it, turn it back on. It's, it, it is, what is that? Uh, they'll come to me. <laughs> uh, adjust our sensor motor phases. We'll show you how to do that. Zero all the values in their sample code. Zero the cruise acceleration. Uh, what do we got next? Um, at the bottom of the code, if you are using a, a wheel or something that can spin indefinitely, you're going to want to figure out a way to zero your encoders. Uh, the, right where the sample comes, every power up, it zeroes the encoder. But there's a couple other common things we use. We use the Talon config clear position on limit switch R. So anytime the reverse limit switch is hit, and you can see on our elevator, we have an upper limit switch and a lower limit switch. So, and those are wired directly into the Talon. So when that switch is made, the power is shut off at the Talon level. So it can't bottom out and keep on driving. Smoke a motor, cause some severe mechanical damage. If you drive it in there fast, things could bend and break a little bit, but it's not continue trying to bend and break. So we, we sometimes will zero our sensors when it hits the reverse limit switch. We don't up here because we're using the feedback. And then there's, I, I put a little star up there for that feedback not continuous. Uh, with some encoders, relative encoders, that's where they are. If, as long as you don't cross the zero point, that you, you can treat the CTRE magnetic encoder as a, is a, this had the word, absolute, there it is as an absolute encoder, and when the mo you shut the motor off or shut the power off, turn it back on, it will read and say, yep, you're at this degrees now. So you can use these encoders as absolute versus incremental. There's that little stars on there just because there's a discussion whether you should set that true or not true. We set it to true. Uh, Omar from CTRE says, not necessarily needed, but it's worked for us, so we just keep on with it. Uh, and then these last three things that do not are not included in the sample code, but we like to throw them in there. The first section is just protecting the motor. There's a big debate out there whether you can stall a motor when you're lifting in like a 755. Can you stall it since there's no active fan on there? And there's a link on the worksheet from a lead mentor from 973. He did a talk in 2016, I believe, with Citrus Circus on motor selection. He goes through a whole long discussion on how to figure out can I stall this motor and how long can I stall it? Really great talk. Brake mode, if you need to hold, if you want to actually, even when you're done commanding, if you want the motor to hold it or if you have some physical brake to hold your device. And then the integral zone, we'll talk about that a little bit when we get into the PID section. I think this is kind of the end of the slides. We're going to walk through the sample code, kind of talk about parts of it. If you have a question, if I breeze by it too fast, you know, get my attention. We'll stop there. This is, this can be interactive. I don't want this to be just me dumping all this information on you. So, and that's the bit that we're going to, we added to there just to show our elevator position. And that's the code that we're going to, we added to it. So we just pull up the actual CTR. Any questions up to this point? It's going to get fun here quick. I, I, I promise if you enjoy coding and reading these things. Uh, I, I, I'll go to bed reading code and it's, uh, enjoy it. So at the top of uh, the sample, right at the top here, that's where they set the Talon node address. It comes by default zero. Unfortunately today, that's what we're using. So we wouldn't change that. The joystick, if you have multiple joysticks, you want to make sure you're using the same joystick. These next couple lines, they come ready to go with follower controllers. So if you do, like on a drivetrain, we have three mini sims on there a Talon SRX with two Vicar SPXs. We'd leave those turned on if we're actually going to use those so they work together. Um, so then we, when we get the robot in it, there's some more follower code that we had to comment out. The next one down there, the feedbacks, config selected feedback sensor, you're going to want to set this one to what device you use. Their sample code uses the CTR rel magnetic encoder in relative mode. It's quite simple. You just delete that, type in analog. If you use IntelliSense, you can type in AN, control, space bar, and it'll give you a list of things that will pop in there. This next part, set sensor phase, set inverted. We're going to leave them like that right now, and we'll, we'll go into the test mode and show what these, these objects do to you. But essentially, if, the, if we command it to go forward with a positive command and our elevator logically goes backwards, we're going to want to reverse our motor phase. 
And at the same time, if we tell it to go forward and it is going forward, but the feedback is negative, we can flip the feedback sensor. So once we set the feedback to the motor, we can flip the motor back and forth and that will always follow. We don't have to flip both of them. You know, flip the motor and then leave the encoder. No, you have to set the, the feedback sensor couple of lines, these other parts are to set up the motion magic. They're part of the defaults. They can be left default. You can read a little bit more into them, but they've always worked for us and we've never touched them. Uh, then the, the KF, KP, I, and D. In their sample code, they use a file and they kind of store all this off in the direction. I like to bring this right into the code so I can edit it directly. We zero them all out so we can set the values, something we're gonna need later. The cruise velocity, the config motion acceleration, set those to zero so we can make sure we set them the way we want. And then finally down into the code, what they're doing is they're taking the, in the sample, they're taking the joystick. And if you've been coding before and you push up on the joystick on an Xbox controller, you get a negative value out of the joystick. They're inverting that so it's up is positive, just make it logical. And then that's what they're doing up there. There's getting some information and populating out to the console, just some data that we can use later. So all the sample code is getting all the information we're gonna need to get the, to calculate our values later on. So then down in button one, if we push button one, it enables motion magic mode. And all it's doing is if you do a half a stick, it's taking 0.5, the joystick value, multiplied by 4096. With the Crossroads magnetic encoder, one revolution is 4096 pulses. So it's saying if you go full stick times 10, whatever is set up, there, the encoder is going to rotate 10 times. And if you go half stick, it's going to rotate five times. And if you go negative, it'll rotate backwards. That's why on a wheel, if your encoder is mounted right on your wheel, uh, I believe on the other side, there's, we have a piece of tape on the wheel when we're practicing there. We can watch that wheel rotate 10 times and we can see it happening. If your encoder's mounted in, like on these shifting gearboxes on the gearbox, this value is the, 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 from the motor to the encoder. Not, and then there's more gear reduction to the wheel. So the wheel is not going to actually spin 10 times, but the encoder will spin 10 times. So you'll have to do some math to figure out how those things are working. And if we're not pushing button one, in the L statement, it just puts the talent into percent output where we can jog the talent SRX. Further on down, they have some other, this is new, just at the beginning of the year. We haven't really used it yet. You remember back on those charts where that, that line came up straight up and just was very trapezoidal? Smoothing, what that can do is, and we call that in the industry jerk, we, we smooth out the beginning so it's a more of an S curve. We, we ride an acceleration and as we approach our cruise velocity, we can smooth that out so it's just not so jerky. We call that, again, jerk. So any questions on their sample? We're gonna open up our actual code, dump it in there, and actually start with the demo right here. And this can go really quick. I'm, I'm going fast, so when we're done, we can come back and hit re revisit some of these steps, but if any, uh, I can't imagine you get, so you got you opened up our code yeah don't push the sample because that in our sample what we did is at the top we created a couple variables uh, let's make sure I'm yeah we created a couple variables for what our min max is what was it was that the okay it failed on the other so should we just do the what control f five? We created a min max at the top. It's downloading here. Why it's downloading? Close that window. Let's, look, let's quickly go over it and show you some of the changes we did. And with coding, we're always thinking like four or five steps ahead. How are we going to help myself later before I can get here now? So this didn't all happen in one step. Coming down. Everything's still, nothing's changed up here in the configuration of the Talon SRX. We're actually down into our code. We did, yep, the analog has changed because we're using a, a 10 turn potentiometer up here on our elevator. We'll talk about that a little bit later. This is our feedback device. Down, 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 right there. We created some min max travels. We'll, we'll get those values where our elevator can actually travel in. We got rid of the joystick times encoder pulses. And when we press button one further on down here, we're just setting our target position to the min travel. 
and doing control motion to that. So we're going to set points. We added a button two, so when we push button two, it goes to the max travel. And if we're not holding the joystick on the L statement, percent mode output, everything else is the same. That's all we changed in there. This has been pushed. Our elevator is a 10 turn potentiometer up here. And this is kind of that, that you, you heard me say something before about the, it's not the row gear, but it, when we figure out these values, we need to know the, the gear reduction between the motor and the feedback sensor. Our gear reduction on our elevator is 80 to one with a 22 tooth sprocket here. So that's giving us our lever and our arms and figuring out how much power we're gonna need. There's another gear reduction between our output of here up to this, I believe it's a 16 to one sprocket up here and a 10 turn potentiometer. So actually the, the gear reduction of this potentiometer for one revolution is a, over a thousand to one. And our worksheet, you can, we'll show you kind of how that works. So the first thing, like I said, what we, what we need to do is we need to set up our, our subsystem to make sure our motors are in phase. We're gonna use a tool. We're gonna go back to that, uh, let me get to the Phoenix tuner, there you go. Over here on the plot tab, up at the top, you can select your device. You see up to we're, we're hooked up, it's green up there in the drop box up at the top, AJ. Yeah. Those are all of our talons that are hooked up to the system right now. So we selected the elevator. What we're gonna really focus on now is we're gonna look at our motor output. It's gonna be plotted in blue. It's gonna give us our current and our PID zero position and velocity. When we enable, is the robot enabled? When we enable the robot, come back to the tuner, we can enable the plotter. It can start plotting this information for us. And he's gonna jog it up. Just kind of slow. And you can see the blue line. That's our percent output. He was commanding it in a positive direction. It was getting a positive command. But you can see our green line, which is our velocity, and our red line trending downward. So we pushed up. Our elevator went in a logical positive direction. The motor output was a positive direction, but our feedback was negative. So what would, what, if we go back to the code, what, what do you think we should flip? The sensor phase, sure. That is correct. So go back to our configuration right there. You can see we have put a false there. There's a little note for us saying it's supposed to be false. Now, save, download the code, Let's confirm that everything is working. Phoenix tuner, there you go. Clear the plot, enable the robot. And jog it all the way up to the stop at nice slow. You'll see up here, he's pushing up there and hit the limit switch and it stops. It won't bottom all anymore. But now you can see our blue line is positive. Our velocity feedback is positive. Our trending output is positive. Everything's in phase and logical so we can move on to the next step. Well, the, uh, well, I guess there's one other thing, too, that we typically want to look at. When we're doing positive, we look down on the Talon SRX to see if it's a green light. It's always nice to make sure those greens are forward or positive, red is negative, and if that wasn't the case, we have to do some other checking, either flipping the polarity, which isn't ideal, or uh, changing the motor direction. So the next step, and this is actually pretty much gets us 100% done. I mean, we could, be, we could be done, but what we need to do is we need to calculate our, what our max velocity is at the encoder. And we can do that empirically by jogging the system with full stick. We're gonna use the, the, the console for this. All that code that was in there that's writing all data, it's taking little snapshots and spitting it onto the console for us so we can read this data a little bit later and see it has been plotting out information. We could use the tuner, but it's a little bit harder to read across and get the exact values out there. Here's actually spitting out values. So when you have a, a motor that can indefinitely spin like a drive frame, you just hold the stick, you can watch the stick, watch the values come up there, let go and you can capture the information. With an elevator or an arm, you are limited. So you're going to want to hold the stick and stop. You're, you, it, you, it's at the mercy of you right at this point to save your machine. So enable it. He's gonna go full stick, disabled it, and you can see how it plotted, or, or scroll down, it, it, it just stopped scrolling. 
all the way to the bottom. When the output was, well, you didn't, you could go a little bit longer in there. So we, di we didn't get, well, was, when the output was one, it was moving at a velocity of about 0.3. Or sorry, yeah, do it again. Click on the console so you can see everything you scroll in there. Maximize that. Maybe you can see it better. Couple in there, so 34. So we're going to record that value down there. So our max velocity empirically is 34. So we can write that down. A couple other things we're going to need to know is what our travel of our elevator is going to be so we can set those set points. We can use the smart dashboard we, with that smart dashboard put number on there. We have a little variable. And see when an elevator is all the way down, it's the first block right there is 164. We can record that. He's going to jog it up all the way until it hits the limit switch. And about 720, 723. We're, we're not trying to be too precise here. We're just trying to get into the ballpark. So we'll write, th we'll write those numbers down. So we have 160-ish, 172, or 720, excuse me, and our max velocity is 34. With those three values, we can get 50% of every, all the information we need to know and have a working elevator at this point where we might not need to do any more tuning. So on those handouts and inside the slideshow, if you look at it, there's a link. We've created this Google Doc to go ahead and allow us to select, so we can select the motor that we're using. So red line, there's a list. And this was copied off of the JVN uh, calculator. If anybody familiar with the JVN calculator used it a little bit, possibly. So we did, we got their data table and we've added the red line motor because they're not on the table and we're using it in this document here. As well as we can pick the encoder. We're using an analog encoder. When you use analog with the CTRE Talon SRXs, it's uh, 1026 or 1024 is the, the resolution. The mag encoders are 4096. If you select that, it's going to populate other fields for us. But when we go ahead and, and in the green box right there, we enter in the value that we, we empirically captured, 34. It spits out that we're running the elevator at 20 RPM at the encoder or the feedback device. The next section right here is just kind of empirically saying, are we okay? So when we selected that red line motor, the red line motor by, by its information is 21,000 RPMs. There's that gearbox reduction at the encoder. There's a little orange section off the side about our Sport 57, the chain, that's the orange box right over there and our 10 turn pot and how we came up with that 10,000 or that 1,000 gearbox reduction. But with that motor at that reduction, we should be running around 20.6 RPM at the encoder. So I would say we're, we're good. We're, we're getting some good information right now. It's a sanity check. So after we entered that information, we have now g calculated our F gain. There's a formula right there and right above there, that 12.6.3 that is a link to the document of, of how to, calculate and figure out and see these steps exactly as we did it. Calculate F gain. So we have 30.088 as a F gain. So we can go K sub F and just write that. We don't have to go over there yet because we got a couple other values that we can, we'll record that number. Now with this information, we know we can run this motor at max speed at 20 RPM. What do we actually want to run this? Do we want to run it at 100% right off the bat? No. When we're in the beginning and we're trying to figure things out and we want to make sure things are working and responding properly, we want to take, take that back. Maybe 50%, maybe 25%. You know, something safe so we can respond and hit the space bar and e-stop it if it all goes south, because it, it can. And when it does on bag and tag day, well, there are no more bag and tag. Four years ago on bag and tag day, about five o'clock, our PID controller went out of control and blew the back end of our robot straight out there through the bumpers. It was, it was scary. We got it, but it was, it was, everyone wanted to cry and quit. So we've done this from minutes at a time. We're gonna go a little more aggressive just so you can see the elevator a little bit more of its glory. So we're gonna try a 75%. We wanna leave a little overhead. So when our controller says, hey, you know, we need to add a little more power, we have somewhere to go to give it a little bit more power, 75%. So full speed, and our initial cruise velocity is going to, we recorded 34. We're going to say, no, we're going to do 26. That's where we're going to cruise at. We're going to come up at some acceleration, hang out at 26 units 
per or 100 milliseconds, then decelerate. We can also figure out our acceleration. How long do we want to take from zero RPM to our cruise velocity? We want to take one second to get there. Do we want something a little softer, two seconds? We want something a little more aggressive, maybe half a second, quarter second? What can our mechanism do? Is our gear train, can it handle those high torque loads? We're going to try about 0.75 seconds, and you'll be able to still see the acceleration with those values. So our acceleration is going to be 34. So with 30.088, 26 and 34, we can go fill in some values into our code. Right in our K sub F, 30.08. We're going to leave P, I, and D alone a little bit right now. We'll look at that. These cruise velocities and accelerations are whole numbers, no decimal points. 26 and 34. Download the code. And now what we should see, oh, well, I know it's already right. Before we download it, we can look at our, our set points just to confirm some of the work we did already. Our min travel, 170, so a little shy of fully down and 700 for our max, or a little shy of max. So now we should be able to enable our robot. And by pushing button two, the elevator should raise, accelerate, cruise, and decelerate to something close to our set point. And you can see if he pushes the button a couple times, it's going to jerk. It's trying to get there. This is purely feed forward controlling this. We're saying apply this much power to go this fast. Well, as motion magics are plotting our little, every one millisecond, it's plotting a new point. It's saying we're done cruising, so there's no power out there, and it's just kind of hovering right there. And you push, if you go down, it's going to crash a little bit, but it's okay. It's not super smooth yet, but there's some things we can do. But it's reacting how we want it. It's going to two set points, a little short. Maximize that console. Yes. We designed for roughly one second uh, floor to the ceiling is what we wanted in there. That's what he wanted in there. I think he got about one and a quarter, but. <laughs> when we go through Motion Magic, you're gonna see this plot right here give us some more information. So if he, hold, if he holds button B, and then just hit Enter to disable, so we can kind of look at what we got here. You can see it's, it's outputting about 73%, 75% right in there. The velocity is about 24 that we set that set point, but there's an error there. It's not quite getting there. So this is where we're going to start tuning a PID controller. And Cross the Road's electronics documentation has some guidelines of how to get there, and they're real rough guidelines, but they work really well. And then you can see our target there was 700. So our max error was about 54, 58. We can record that number. And let's go over that worksheet. The next section down right here is our given error. We'll type in 54 there. And Crossroad Electronics says, you know, with an error, maybe we should apply 10% more power. So that's with that 10% power. And if you want to in increase that, you can change that very well. With our worksheet, the green sections are places we enter data. The yellow sections are data that it returns back to us. So you can say, you know what, our P game, there's the formula that they suggest using, is about 1.894. So let's record that number and put it into our code for our p-value. And this is the point of PID. Who's tuned to PID controller? It's a lot of back and forth, right? A lot of back and forth, a lot of back and forth. We're going to enter this number in there, download, and we're going to run that test again. Run it all the way up and see what the error is. Yeah, don't worry about the white space, it'll go. Oh, you yeah, deleted a comma? Oh. Go ahead and enable our robot, look at the console, and push the B button, see what we got. The error's improved, but there's still some work to be done there. So we can go back, tune it up, tune it up to it until we get some oscillation. That's typically what, what our instructions tell us to do. We've come up with a value of about 4.6. So 
So if we enter that into the code, not there, uh, into our actual code, our, our elevator does use constant force springs. They're tucked away inside the tubing right there. So there is some counter balance inside the elevator already. Am I losing anybody quite yet? Seem interesting, doable. So just with that P, bumped up to 4.6, it should operate a lot. And it's getting really close to the errors 10, 11. It's, it's reasonable. We can start tuning that out. And that's kind of the next step. We can use a little bit of integral. And that's an integral window that we've seen in the code. If we have a, a, a range that we know this usually falls into, we can then start applying a, a little bit more power. And this is the error, integral is the error over time. And so it stacks up over and over and over again. When we're outside of that window, it, it, it zeroes it and it deletes it. But when we're inside that window, that when we set it to about 30 encoder units or feedback units, when we're inside that window, we start applying some integral. By recommendation, they say start out really small. 0 0.001 is typical. And start working your way up there. But integral is very, can, can be very dangerous, especially if it does, because it accumulates over time. So if nothing's moving, it's going to get over bigger, bigger, bigger. If you're up against something hard, you might start smoking motors. So we're going to add our integral about 0 0.01, but also a D gain. That's the, kind of puts the brakes on a PID controller. When we're coming up to a set point and we're going a little bit too fast, it's the change of time underneath the curve. There's a lot of theoretical stuff out there, and I kind of accept it. Don't really go into it too much. And again, crossover electronics is just about 10 times P gain works really well. And right now, Austin, if you go up and down on the elevator f with the buttons, I, th I believe it's going to hit pretty hard on the bot going down right now. Not too bad. But if we go into the code, and the, these values are right in the, the, they're linked right on that worksheet to the documentation, real rough, get you close. And I could say that where we're at right now, these are the values we ran during competition. It worked. The other thing as we approach our set points, especially in the up, we're fighting gravity. That's going to be the next step, talking about arbitrary feed forward. With an elevator and the console for springs, they're, they're kind of one and the same. Arbitrary feed forward, we'll get into right after we test the, the values. Errors got improved to six. Settles down a little bit, a little bit nicer on the bottom, didn't quite hit quite as hard, and that's that D value saying, oh, back it off. We can now go up to our rocket ship we built, jog that motor up there, look at the smart dashboard, record the current value of the encoder, because we're only working in encoder units right now. It's not empirical units or metric or anything. We're purely operating in just encoder ticks. When we go to our arm, we did convert all that over to degrees, because you're going to need that information. But for the elevator, we knew 600, 425, empirical. If the Pardon me? That's in the arm. But for the elevator, we just m drove, jogged it, recorded it. If they wanted to change a little bit, we knew about five made it better. So arbitrary feed forward. And any questions up to this point? Comments, concerns? This is when the light bulb went on for me. This is the first year we did an arm, and arms have scared me. And scared scares a lot of people. And if you ever dealt with an, who dealt with an arm before, trying to control it, very tough, right? Because right here, when the arm is horizontal, you need all the power in the world to break gravity. But as soon as it gets all the way to the top, it wants to smash into the stop. It's really hard to slow that down. So you're you're playing with P controllers, and just it's it's very difficult. So we're going to show you how to calculate arbitrary feed forward on the on the elevator, and we're just going to download our arm code in there and show you how it works there too. But to Figure it out arbitrary feed forward. What we need to do is it's gravity compensation. It's how much power do we need to apply to this motor, this subsystem, to hold it steady. So if we go, what tool did we recommend using on that? Back here, I think. Oh, we just use our console. Open up the console, 
enable the motor. We're going to jog the elevator. It's, remember, when if we're not pushing any buttons, our elevator's in jog mode. We're going to jog the elevator about halfway up and just feather back on the elevator until it stops and holds position. And you can see the outputs, when it's holding steady, is 1.4. We'll bring it down. 1.5%. If you take 12 volts times 0.15, you get something less than 2 volts. If you go watch that video that I've talked about from that, that lead mentor of 973, he talks about at 2 volts, you can stall a red line or a 755 motor indefinitely without smoking it. So that's our arbitrary feed forward. We can go into our elevator code. Instead of using a two parameter talent SRX dot set control mode motion magic comma set point, we're gonna add two more parameters to that that method. And they're commented right next to there. The delete the uh, backslash backslash and all the way back there. One more. One more delete. That's our four parameter set. Control mode motion magic target DMEN type, arbitrary feed forward, and what we want that arbitrary feed forward is. With an elevator, gravity is always the same, going up and down, up and down. At this point, we we'll probably want to go back, retune our PID, because we've now, what the arbitrary feed forward does is before we do any PID control or any uh, holding that position, the motor is just going to go straight to 0 0.15. It's just going to, that's, that's, that's its new zero point. So that's what it takes to do gravity. So now the PID controller only has to worry about moving our elevator, not actually holding it and fighting gravity. Same thing as what a constant force spring might do for you. The reason for the constant force springs are to bring that voltage down. So when we design our gear mechanisms and our elevator, that we can make sure that we stay below that threshold and not smoke one of our motors. It's not real magical with an elevator. Where it's magical is through the arm. So, any questions up to this point? Okay. Uh, go to recents or out yeah, there at arm. Open up that folder. This is the exact same code as we've just been looking at in our elevator. The only difference is here is to jog this motor, we have to push button three to enable. We added one more uh, variable. We didn't do an else always open loop or percent output. We have to push button one for our elevator, or our arm to be in one position, button two to put it in the other position, and button three, we can turn it into jog mode for our sample code. We've already tuned all this. We're not going to go through that part. The only thing difference is when you scroll down to the logic, as you can see, target position is our pick position. We go ahead and every 20 milliseconds, or as our robot scans, it's going to go out to this function called arbitrary or get feed forward. We can look at that in the down below. So go to get feed forward. And this is every scan. We're going to, as the robot comes through here, as we're holding that button, what's the current angle of our arm? There it is. Get feed forward. So our horizontal, we, we did the same thing. We had our arm at horizontal. It was roughly 0.15. Again, a safe spot to be. Won't smoke the motor. We do some math. We must operate in radians here. So we get the current angle of the arm, get the theta, take the cosine of that theta, because when we're at zero degrees, cosine of zero is one. So we need 100% of our arbitrary forward, feed forward. Cosine of 90 is zero. So when we're fully up, we, need, we don't need any arbitrary feed forward. And somewhere in between, we need some scalar value of that. Pump some math in there. We populate the smart dashboard just for some feedback for ourselves return up to the, the command emotion magic every 20 milliseconds, it new feed forward, new feed forward, it's constantly updating. So if you download this code in there, we could probably zero that and look at the different, I've never done it, it's been a while. Look at the arm with or without arbitrary feed forward, that'd be fun. Right to horizontal, right to up. Should we see what it looks like without arbitrary feed forward? That would probably be effective. I don't, I don't know what this is going to do. It's, I'm, I'm predicting it's going gonna, it's gonna to slam when it gets all the way, or it's not going to go at all. I don't know. Just put uh, that 0.15 at zero. Horizontal hold. 
I bet it's not going to move at all because it won't have enough power to overcome gravity. I might need to help it. That worked pretty well, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I'm betting this has been tuned down a little bit since in competition. Well, that's unfortunate. I was hoping it will be more horrific. You've all seen an arm slam before. <laughs> so we can all this code. We I can get it up, put it up on our GitHub's, so we can take a little bit closer look at it. There's one more couple t talking points I want to just hit up before when we do get into motion magic and we use the command base robot subsist or robot model go to that last slide on our our slideshow all oh, those are the steps we took yep 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 other considerations one of the big things you're going to notice when you're doing motion magic and most of the other PID controllers with the Talon SRX, if you command the Talon in motion magic to go to a set point, let's say we told that arm to go down and then for some reason we disabled the robot and we just manually lifted that arm back up again. When we enable that robot, that command is still in the Talon and it's, once that Talon's enabled, it's going to slam back down to the last set point it was in. It's going to ignore the acceleration. It's going to ignore the cruise velocity. It says, my last set point was down here and it's going to go there, pretty much saturated output. And you're going to get scars on the top of your head and things are going to happen. So a good thing to do is in your either Telelop init method or your auto init method is to call that subsystem and put the Talon into percent output mode. Put the simple, simply put talon dot set control mode percent output zero. So before the robot actually is fully enabled, the talon said, I'm told not to move. So now the next time a motion magic command is going in there, it says, okay, I'm currently here. I need to get there. And it's going to start plotting out new points to get there. So it'll be a controlled motion. That's probably one of the biggest takeouts. And there's a, there's a thread probably... I don't know, a few dozen comments back and forth. I, I was chatting with a guy, I believe he's out of Australia. We were doing some testing and some, and come up with how to solve that sort of problem. So that's, that's it. Any questions of the different steps? How long did that? About 55 minutes, we started a little late. Yes. Sure, go to the Phoenix Tuner. Uh, is, is, go to, is the robot enabled? No, it's not. Enable the robot. Now go to Phoenix Tuner. If you go to Control, we have the elevator select right now. We can take that slider and start sliding it into a positive direction. Have your finger on the space bar or the enter button, so that'll disable things. But. Duh. It shouldn't matter. Uh, you may have to click. Oh, there it is. Remember, the code that we downloaded only is code that's relevant to the the arm, but right now I'm, since I have elevator selected, I am jogging this motor. Config, you can look at all the current configuration, all the values that are been loaded into the Talon SRX. These are all the different values that have been loaded in there. And you can actually go in here and change them too. Say, I, I, it's not an analog, I'm gonna change it to a quadrature. So you can change all the values from this little GUI versus do it all in code. So you can experiment a little bit more about some of the different parameters that are available. Pardon me? Correct. Self-test. A lot of times if you're having a problem and you're contacting Crossroad Electronics, they're going to say, do a self-test. See what, see what mode it is in. So if we actually run a self-test on the elevator, 
It's going to say the device is not able, the current velocity, what mode brake is in neutral. Uh, and it gives you a lot of information of at that snapshot in time, what is that motor doing? So if you're if it's not act if it's not acting right or not moving, you can come over to do a self test, do a self and get what is the current state of that motor. Those are the tools that we mostly use. And that's in this tab here that you should be all well aware of. In the plot tab, once you start getting in there, you can enable these target position and Yeah, you're in the arm. Shut some of these plots off. These are just the motion magic stuff that's going on here. So the purple line is the target and the velocity. And you can kind of see the curves, how it's going. And that's, that's the actual motion magic planner that's inside the town. I said what it's doing. And we, we use that tool a lot when we're trying to figure out how is the motion magic working? When, when it gets to a set point and you move it, where does it calculate its next set point? And it's calculated from the last calculation, not where its current position is. And that's where it's important to put your motor into percent output because it's not, when it transitions back to enable, it says, oh, the last set point was over here. So anything I'm going to calculate can come off of that point right there, not where it's currently at. Just to give it a fresh motion magic command. Other things? Yes. Do we do any logging? No, but it, I mean, the, we should. If you're looking at the driver stations, you're seeing a lot of the log, the current stuff there, but nothing on the. We don't do anything. I, I know there's teams out there that gather a ton of information. So. Yes. With motion magic, yeah, because what it's doing is it's operating purely on feed forward in the beginning. It's just it's it's running, and that's where we see that big lag through the whole process. It says, okay, here are the points. Here's what the 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 feed forward value is added to after the PID controller. So, yep, PID calculated zero, but then said, okay, now add our feed forward. And to go at this velocity, we needed uh, we had that feed forward at thirty point zero eight eight. So. If we're trying to do 10% or uh, at, we're trying to do 10 units per to, uh, per 100 milliseconds times the feed forward off, and that's what got the motion going is the feed forward and with the, with the cruise and the acceleration as its constraints to run that profile. Good questions. Yes, Tom. No, our drivetrain is all been some code that we've uh, acquired and kind of been influenced by a team out of New, New Jersey, the Manic Mayhem 15. I'll have to look at it. We, I'd have to look at our code base. It's written at the top, but at 15, 18, or 15, 19, not 100%, but they do some really great stuff with the talent SRX. They, they copied the, the robot, the WPI robot drive object extracted out what they needed to do a basic drivetrain and they're instead of just doing a percent or a negative one to one value to the motors they're saying run the talons at a velocity and let the talons actually close loop themselves and yeah we're doing that on we're, we're using influence code from that we could spend an entire day kind of read through that and if you enjoy reading code uh you can definitely go to our github i'll get you links to that and ours might not be the most cleanest to look at because it's been hacked around on. But again, we every time we grab a piece of code from another team, we make sure we comment it in there to say kind of as a, hey, thanks for this information. And that's kind of the great thing about first is that code sharing, building off each other's stuff. The, the drivetrain, and, and I've started experimenting a little bit, that's kind of going to the motion profiling. This year they included in the WPI libs the JC Pathfinder. JC's Pathfinder. She wrote a, a program that you can draw your paths on the field and then it exports a CSV file of all the points at 
time intervals of where you're supposed to be at what velocity. And we've experimented a little bit about that and got, I'm going to call it about 75% of the way there. We're just doing positioning of the drivetrain. Now is the next step is you try to import the gyro too, so it closed loops on a gyro. But that's the motion profiling step, and that's kind of the, the magic where you understand the magic. Motion magic does all that for you. It's magical. It's quite appropriately named. I have to give them that. And motion profiling is kind of understanding what's actually happening there. So I know I didn't really answer it, but it's our, our motion magic is our arm, our elevator, and our floor pickup. The floor pick is real simple. Go down to the floor, 90 degrees, come back up, 90 degrees. But that tuning process is so easy. Why not just do it? And we don't have our driver station here, so we need two driver sticks to get to go in. But essentially, that comes straight down vertically, mechanically, then folds flat forward. And we designed it so we could pick up the hatches within our frame perimeter. So we can technically go across the field, and we did it in practice a couple of times, and steal hatches off the ground from the other side for quicker cycles. Didn't Never used it in, in practice during the game, because the excitement of the game, you kinda, if, if there wasn't one on the ground, you missed it. But it can be done. We use it on our side of the field quite a bit if there's a hatch dropped, but never enter across the field over. It's a uh, 200 or a 170 degree potentiometer as well. So it's a potentiometer on our arm. Uh, it's just basically right here on the motor. Our foot is a potentiometer, and we like that because it's, it's um, not incremental, but absolute. You power it off. If something moves, you power back on that new voltage rating, and that's just where it is. It's absolute all the time. But you can use the CTRE magnetic encoders in absolute mode as long as it doesn't cross over a full 100 or 360 degrees. And if you originally index it properly, I know uh, at week zero, the green machines, there's a few of you here. You had some issues with uh, one of your, was it your flipper, your actual climb? Arm yeah, it was the arm thing. It was just every time you powered up, it was something different. <laughs> yeah. And, and I was talking to one of your mentors, and he said, yeah, there was this, it was going over center. So you just got to be a little bit more wary of when you set it up originally, that you set it up, the magnets in the right index. And yeah, those are like the, the absolute encoders and potentially the only ones you can do with apps for absolute position. If you just use a regular uh, quad sharing encoder, you power off, you lost a spot. You have to now have some way to re-zero. And our scissor last year used two, two motors running motion magic to run two screws to run our scissor full up and down. So we were running motion magic on both of them, commanding them both to follow each other. So they stay in time with a bit of a mechanical timing as well. And I think it only happened once in week zero, but our elevator was halfway up and it wasn't, it wasn't in, we couldn't do relative or absolute. So we had incremental and when the machine powered back up again, that was our new zero. But fortunately on our driver station, we had a button that we could push and the, the elevator would automatically jog in percent output down until it hit both limit switches, re-zero the encoders, and we're back off and running again. But we had to think ahead. How are we going to re-zero these encoders on a power cycle? Yeah. Similar uh, in uh, Stronghold, we had some... We had sea legs, amazingly in Stronghold. This year, we did not have sea legs. That was the major climb thing. We could actually hop over some of the defenses and see, uh, with our, a couple legs that just lifted the robot up about a half inch, and we got hung up because we had mechanisms that year, and we got hung up on the uneven ground or the rocky train in practice, I think, once, and then we just kind of ka-chunk, 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 and those things walked us right off the, right off the edge. And, but we had a lot of judges afterward going, how did you guys get off that wall? But there was an encoder on that as well as a... I think that was a West Coast magnetic limit switch that just, every time you crossed it, it re-zeroed the, the axis. So. Oh. When do you do the tuning? You know, the pit tuning and all that. I mean, do you have to make any mechanical changes like the wheels or intake wheels or something? Do you have to retune every time? 
You know, like many teams, as a, when do we do our tuning if we'd make changes? Good to confirm. Uh, I think like many teams, we're kind of building right to the end, and we only get a short week of tuning all this stuff up and hoping that we're going to get there. And we haven't had too many, ex you know, poor experiences after adding, and we don't really add too much after the fact. But there is some, if you add a significant change, then, yeah, they're going to have to kind of reconfirm and re recommission the subsystem. Keith? Yes. The uh, load the profile that's um, just motion profiling. Yeah. That was a little bit we've I've experimented a little bit with the drivetrain and starting to figure that out. Their sample code is really good for single axis and get it working again. And we did get we do have one bit of code that we're actually taking JC's Pathfinder, <laughs> exporting the CSVs, reading them into our code, and doing that path. And it took a little bit of doing because we kind of cutting up, cut and paste, because I think JC's Pathfinder and her libraries that are included in the WPI packages, you it does a lot of the motion profile calculation in the robot controller, where now we're dumping it into the Talon and streaming it in. So very limited. That's that's kind of the, my next barrier of entry, where if I, I'm going to try to figure it out so I can then again spread it on to the students and try to get some people understanding that, too. <laughs> Because that's true magic right now for to me. <laughs> so. Are there any teams that did do JC Pathfinder this year? Yeah, there wasn't a lot of need for autonomous this year, so I think, I think people didn't put a lot of effort into that part of it. We did have one auto that that we had tuned up that we could drive us off the level one and get us lined up on the side of the cargo ship and get us close. So we just never dialed in our encoders to get the distances right because we never needed it, never used it. The driver just got used to driving and did it. And then I guess we did have two autos if we loaded a hatch on the front of the cargo ship. We could hit left or right and it would automatically return to the loading station, drive itself back to the loading station. And again, we used it once and it wasn't quite tuned up yet and it came shooting across the field, hit the wall, turned, and then drove to the driver's station. Kind of scared the judges a little bit. All right, well, we could tune that up a little bit, but we never spent much time on it. Well, if that's it then, uh, like I said, the links are there. Uh, if you go to thegrandcitygearheads.com, you can definitely email if you have further questions. The slideshows have all those steps in the different tabs or different slides of what we did there. But uh, to recap, you make sure your motors are in phase, going in a logical direction to you. Calculate your feed forward, ex cruise and excel velocities, and then just some really brute force uh, and with using some rule of thumb PID controllers, you have an elevator that's really reliable or a, a mechanism to move forward. Well, if that's all, I thank you. And I thank the Fire Bears for inviting us down here this evening. And good luck in the season to come and the off-season events. I hope that maybe you can come over and we'll be at Gitchy and MRI. So if you're at one of those events, uh, come over and let me know how things are going. If I don't hear from you beforehand, I welcome any comments or questions. So that's all. Thanks. <laughs>